great. Awesome. So yes, I am Steve Jones. I am a 14-year veteran at Microsoft. I um, launched Windows 7 Beta, Windows 8, Windows 10. Um, I was an MVP for many years before coming to Microsoft. I own my own consulting company. Um, I was on the OneDrive team for several years and was involved in the relaunch of OneDrive with the brand new client when we finally killed that horrible Groove.exe client. Uh, I moved over to the M365 team and for the past two years I've been on the Microsoft Teams team. I also host a show called Inside Microsoft Teams that several people, including David Patrick, who's sitting in the session, have been a guest on. We sit down uh, every few weeks with a customer, uh, with an IT pro who is, um, you know, working for a company that has thrown out and uh, is deployed and uh, broke out with uh, Microsoft Teams. We sit down with MVPs, Microsoft engineers, so a wide variety of folks. If you have questions during the session or something to add, just type it in. Uh, I am happy to stop and answer that question if you'd like to know more or you have some questions, et cetera. Um, you, if you have any follow-up questions, you can reach me on Twitter. It's the best way to reach me. I'm at Stephen L. Rose. And if you want to check out the show, go to aka.ms slash inside MS Teams. And I will also add, uh, I know Jay. Jay uh, and I met during a SharePoint day. He's one of the uh, folks who are leading the conference today. But I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I love Chicago. I grew up in Buffalo Grove. I lived downtown for many years. I lived about a uh, half a block from uh, Cabaret Metro and Wrigley Field. I lived at Western in Chicago, and you probably can't see it back there too well, but there's a whole shelf. I will point my camera at it that is completely filled with Chicago stuff. Um, I'm a Blackhawks fan, Cubs fan, went to the, one of the World Series games when the Cubs won a few years ago. So and I'm even wearing my Cubs shirt today. So, uh, and I'm a Geno's East fan. I love Garrett's popcorn and Mr. Uh, actually, uh, Al's is my favorite uh, beef sandwich, but I'm always good with a Portillo. So, all right, let's move forward and take a look. So Satya uh, at our last Ignite talked about hybrid work and it being the biggest shift to how we will uh, work in our generation and that there are going to be new models uh, for the way that people work, places work, and for processes. So let's dig a little deeper into that. By hybrid work, we're really talking about our three different types of workers, the ones who are only working at home, the ones who are spending time at home and in the office, and of course the ones who are in the office. But what's interesting, um, I'm going to skip the video for now and move past that, but what's interesting is how people define that and view that and how we as IT give people flexibility and how, when, and where people work. So if we take a look at the data, this is what's interesting is that 73% of uh, people that we took a look at, this is the work trends index that was done um, middle to late last year. So from July until October, November, 73% said we want flexible remote options to stay. 67% said we want more in-person work or collaboration post-pandemic. We also saw that there was no one-size-fits-all approach, that 58% of people who spent the most time in the office tell us they plan to do more focus work, 58% who plan to spend less time in the office, 41% considering leaving their current employer, Employer and 46% planning a major a career transition. Why? Because for the first time, companies are really seeing that you can work from anywhere and be just as productive as workers who are in the office and that you have to be here, you have to be in the office, or you have to pick up and relocate for the first time is not uh, becoming a, pre a prerequisite for many companies. So we're seeing people that are taking advantage of that. And all of that comes together as we take a look at all of the different types of workers. We have, of course, internal, we have information workers, employees to managers, first line workers, and external. So what we require is really a new digital fabric that really encompasses and binds this organization together with secure communications, uh, the ability to collaborate and to create and communicate in all new ways. So our new operating model is really based around three things. We look at people and how every industry function and role can harness this change. 
uh, and how they turn this into a competitive um, uh, advantage. We look at where people can work from because the mantra has always been and is really during the pandemic even more so. I want to be able to work from anywhere on any device securely. And that's really the key. It's not about securing the device. I keep talking to people every day. Oh, we've really locked down SharePoint. We've done this. I'm like, why aren't you just turning on Azure Information Protection and tracking that data and removing access to that data or using Teams Connect and doing private groups and private chat and things like that. So a lot of it is really awareness and changing those processes to allow people to do this. At the center of this is to allow people to connect naturally, which is that work from any device, work anywhere. Collaborate your way. What makes the most sense? Um, do you want to be in an office? Do you want to be from home? Turning on Teams meetings and allowing you to do breakout rooms or to be able to do whiteboards or things along that line, that makes sense. And have work in context. And this really speaks to some of our newer technologies like Loop, which I'll talk about in a few moments. So it really is how we bring that together and how Teams supports that as an end-to-end -end solution. So many of you are saying, yeah, you know, we've already rolled out Teams, or this is great, or where do we start? Or what I hear very commonly is we've rolled it out, but we're really only using it for calls. How do we really get people to collaborate with Teams? And I think before we talk about new features and functionality, it's important to really talk about how to set yourself up for success. So I want to start with something very interesting which is for the first time ever in the history of work, we have four generations working at the same time, and we've never had this. But what's interesting is these four generations are so very different in how they work. 4% of all employees within companies are baby boomers. These are folks who were born with a PC and a small monitor right there on the desktop. Maybe it was a 486 with a turbo button, but to them, the app and the data and everything sits on that computer. They still sometimes print up hard copies. I'm amazed when I travel, I see people walk around with a big folder with all of their travel plans all printed up and I'm like, trip it on your phone, much easier. But that's how they work. And it's important to understand that's how they view things. 38% Gen X, they were the first generation to get laptops and be able to be mobile. For those of you that are older, you probably remember things like PCM CIA cards to allow you to have wireless in your laptop, but we're still looking at on the metal, uh, you know, apps and the data still sitting on that device. So this is 40% of your workforce that is not really leveraging cloud apps that are not really working from a variety of devices. And it's important to understand this because as you work with them and get them on board, how they see work is very different. And these are the folks who still very much feel if you're not in the office, you're not being productive, that you can't be as productive from home or from a Starbucks. Now on the other side, the workers that we really want to keep because they're less expensive to hire, they want to learn, um, et cetera, starting with our millennials, this is the first generation that was born in the cloud. By that, I mean that these folks were the first ones to do email in the cloud, Google Docs, Office 365, et cetera. They're comfortable working off of a tablet uh, or an iPad, but they can really work from anywhere and be just as productive because everything important to them is in the cloud. So they just need a browser and a way to get at it, and they're able to do everything that they want to do. And this is really at the core of the next level of collaboration. And then finally, Gen Z, the newest generation of workers coming in, these are the folks that don't see a difference between a cell phone and a laptop. They just see it as a way to get to their content. If you have kids that are in high school or like my daughter in college, I've watched her from the backseat of the car, working on a project, chatting with someone, FaceTiming, listening to music, and then uploading it to a SharePoint site and collaborating with five people off her phone faster than I can do it on a laptop. And that's because everything's fluid. Everything is in the cloud, how you're gonna work and connect. They also don't see email as a primary form of communication. They see email as a way to tell people that there's donuts in the break room, but not how you get work done. Now, I know for some of you that's, a big shift in how you're thinking because you're like, no, no, we use email. Email is really for wide, something that reaches everybody in the company. Here's a new policy. Here's our, you know, facts and figures or our, you know, profit for the last quarter, things that affect everybody in the company. But if you're working on projects 
and things along that line, that's where leveraging teams and keeping all of that data inside of that team is important. I love when I sit with folks in these different generations and I ask them, if you were to start, uh, if you were to leave your job, how easy would it be for, how easy would it be for someone to come in and step into your role? They would go, oh, it'd be hard. I have to send them all these emails and drive them to these documents and do a document. Yet when you turn to millennials or Gen Zs that are using Teams or using Slack, they go, no problem. I just get, let them into the Slack channel or into the team. All the meeting recordings, all the documents, all the chats, everything about that project right up until the day I left is right there. And everything that they need to know is right there. So very different ways of looking at things. And it's important to understand that as you are bringing in new employees or trying to understand why certain people are more adept at um, leveraging this technology than others. So the one thing I hear constantly is, hey, a lot of companies, we had Skype for Business, we were using it for chatting and calling, and we're excited to go to Teams uh, because we've got all this great other stuff. And then when I talk to them at a year later, they go, yeah, 80% of our users are on Teams, but they're only using it for chat and for calling, not using it for these other areas. Well, why not? Well, there's a few reasons. To be successful, these are my five or six keys to success with Teams. Number one, get all of your content into OneDrive and SharePoint. By that, I mean get your X drives, Y drives, Z drives, all those into SharePoint. Get rid of those drives. Number two, Turn on known folder move, which is available for PC and Mac. That redirects every file and uh, every document that's on the desktop and in my docs to out uh, to OneDrive. The great thing is it's completely seamless to end users. They still see every document that was in their my that was on their desktop, everything that was in their my docs, but it's also now in the cloud. When they open it on their device, it automatically opens up a version. Whatever they change automatically syncs to the cloud. But what's great is when they share that content, they're sharing one version. You don't have 20 versions of docs flying around. And if their laptop dies and they get a new laptop, within seconds after signing into OneDrive, every file is right back there on their desktop and right there inside of my docs. And Instead of having to do these X drives, Y drives, everything is in SharePoint, which also allows you to do everything from set up policies for uh, legal holds to who can access this to who can't, et cetera. Number two, um, MFA, multi-factor uh, multi authentication. Get rid of the password. It's not what you know, it's what you have. You should only allow people to be able to access files, folders, content on your network the first time if they're an employee or external through facial recognition or through biometrics. It's one of the easiest ways to create solid security and to keep out hackers, yet not all of our customers are still using some form of MFA. Azure Active Directory, turning on and leveraging Azure Active Directory is gonna get rid of the need for you to have to add people to your tenant, to your Teams groups, uh, every time they need to access content, which gets difficult to manage. With Azure Active Directory, you can turn on Azure B2B or Azure Connect, and you can grant people access only to a group, to a private group, to a team, to a chat, and only to the content stored within that. So you can create these sandboxed areas for people who are going to be sharing and accessing and being part of a team or group externally much more easily. Next. We take a look at moving from us to we. How do we do that? And that's a much longer conversation that I'm not really going to get into, but the key to it is really having a change management process. If you are not familiar with change management, if you've never done change management, I encourage you to bring on a change management expert. But understanding how to create things like change champions, how to uh, get a group of people are going to start to play with this and can give you feedback on their jobs, where their pain points are, and how you can adjust that is so important. And we could do a whole separate session on that. And I've done some on my show, and I encourage you to check it out. Adoption before deployment. Your second step after piloting should be preparing for adoption and starting adoption. If you have deployed and you have not done your preparation for adoption, which is setting up learning portals, helping people to understand <coughs> why they're changing, getting senior level management buy-in, getting them to turn on their cameras and to use the product, moving your content into the cloud, then you're gonna find it very, very difficult to have the level of success with Teams 
and the usage across all the features that I'm going to be talking about here in a few minutes as successfully as other companies have. When I take a look at some of the customers that I've had on the show, uh, and I encourage you to check that out, we really talk about how did you make teams successful and some of the feedback and some of the things that we heard were interesting. For example, Polaris, <coughs> pardon me, let's get a drink of water here. Polaris said, and I love this, we love chat in meetings. And I go, what do you mean? They go, we love it when people chat during meetings. Well, you can't chat in a real meeting. If everybody's sitting in a room and somebody chats, that turns into something distracting. But when we're having a meeting in Teams and people are chatting, it shows me they're engaged. They have an idea. What if we did this? I love seeing that because it not only shows engagement, but it also allows people who normally might not engage verbally to have a stake at the meeting, to make it more even for everybody. And we have found that we've come up with much better ideas um, and better ways to work since people started chatting in meetings. Susquehanna Valley Central School District, they are using Teams in the classroom, even when students are back in person. Why? Because they can have a camera in the front of the room, let's say in a science class that focuses in on a science model or a dissection. It gives every student a front row seat, whether they're home or in the classroom. And again, allows the students to talk to each other and engage. They also use whiteboard cameras, which is great. Lego, Lego says everybody in our company is a first adopter. We're going to roll out all the features and functionality and give it to everybody because we want people to play with those features and to see if it's something that can help them to do their job better. Rather than worry, how are people going to do this? And we're going to hold off on that feature and we have to train. Once they're in the mindset of everything that comes out can help, it's going to get people to try things and do things, which has helped them to be eminently more successful. And they're a company that's all about collaboration, not only in how they work, but also in their toys. AEG uh, is actually using Teams at their physical live events. So they manage sporting events and sporting venues like the LA Kings and the Lakers and uh, Coachella. They actually use it to say, hey, gates are open, Player code 14, players are now here, we're running out of hot dog buns there. They use it as a way to communicate in real time with their frontline workers. And if there's a problem, they can go back, take a look at the timestamps and the conversations and come away with really interesting information. And Cargill did a great deep dive um, on the importance of change management, which I can't sum up in a few minutes, but I encourage you to check it out. Go to the link and you can see that. So let's talk about what's next for Microsoft Teams as we talk about meeting, chatting, calling, collaborating, and automating. Well, one of the newest features um, that we are, um, you know, that we announced is Loop. And Loop is a really cool feature because what Loop allows you to do is have what we call live elements. And what does that mean? What that means is whether you're in the Microsoft Loop app, whether you're in PowerPoint, Word, uh, teams, you can create living, breathing documents. So imagine if you send out a, 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 you know, a spreadsheet to all your salespeople that talk about how much they've sold that month. Every time they need new data, they ask you, hi, can I get an updated version of this or an updated version of this? So they have to open up that spreadsheet and wait for it to refresh and wait for all that information. This allows me to put components, whether it's an agenda, a spreadsheet, anything directly into any Word, OneNote, PowerPoint, Teams, or into a loop document, and it will automatically update and stay current every time you look at the document. So it always has the latest information. It also allows you to pick up and move content fluid. It allows you to see who else is working within these documents. It really dramatically changes how we think about working together as we work. So every time you think about something that has to have multiple people working on it that is going to update or a document with information that people need on a regular basis, think about how Loop can remove that need to continually reshare that information. The next thing that's really going to help that and to drive more of this information when you need it is uh, uh, adding context IQ to Microsoft Editor. One moment. Um, in that because we don't need that. So hang on. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. So uh, as we take a look at Context Editor, and let me swap that. 
what we'll see here is as we need specific elements as we move through uh, a document, for example, not only can we use the editor for spelling and all this other great stuff, but it's going to be more aware. So it's going to say, hey, I'm assuming based on what you said, you're trying to say this and all you have to do is hit tab and it will drop it in. But we also now can do things like start to type in the name of a person or a document and it will say, hey, is this the document you're looking to add? Yep, it fits in context with the people I'm talking to and it will automatically add it if you say yes. It will also show the people who have had access or created this document and automatically list them as you start to say things like reach out to. You're obviously going to be putting in a person. So presenting you with information that you have, or when you say let's review, it, editor automatically telling you when you have availability and that person does too, it's gonna make it easier. That way, if you say, hey, let's, why don't we chat on Thursday? It's gonna say both of you, these, this is your free time. Let's drop this in right here. And then I'll also add a team uh, calendar event or an Outlook calendar event. So adding these intelligent aspects and bringing in loop is gonna make it easier to bring forth the information that you want and that you need when you are ready for it and looking for it. Whiteboard, we've added a lot of new functionality to Whiteboard. I'm a big fan of Whiteboard. I like to kind of sit back and, and draw being a uh, an ex trainer. I was an MCT for many years and used to teach a lot of certification tracks. So being able to uh, do that is super important for me and really makes it um, much more visual as I'm trying to get a point across, but we've added things like shapes and templates and images and stickers and things to make it much easier as well as loop elements and that is rolling out as we speak. Teams Connect. Teams Connect is a double click on Azure AD and what that allows you to do is to create a shared channel or shared chat. So imagine you've got a Teams channel and you want to allow three external vendors who are working on a project you can create a shared channel. This is a channel within the team where all those folks have only access to whatever is published in that channel, set in that channel, or documents that are dropped into that channel. They don't have access to anything else that is in that team, only to what is in that channel. You can also do private channels and private chat, which allows you to take a step down and have a private channel within a channel or a private chat within a chat that only certain people can see and access, but that's internal. Shared channels and shared chat is a way to bring in external people into that sandboxed area with it. That is something that is in uh, public preview right now, so you can play with that and you can try that and roll that out. But again, you must have Azure AD uh, in order to be able to use that. And again, if you have any questions during the presentation, Feel free to type them in or raise your hand and I'll be happy to answer them. The other thing that we've heard is for to design for people that are not in the room. And what do I mean by that? So we've added a whole different variety of different together modes that really help you to feel uh, more connected to the people. Uh, present notes and slides and everything with PowerPoint Live and Teams. This allows you to not allow people to move forward to a slide or to see what's going on. We also have these different presenter modes and you can see up here, I have a standout mode, I have a side-by-side -side mode and a reporter mode. And we can see those here, that's my standout mode, that is my reporter mode and that's my side-by-side. -side. So you can choose how your video feed shows up as you're presenting to people. And it will also add, as you have more and more attendees join a session, uh, you will have a dynamic view that allows you to have hundreds of people and all of their video going at the same time, or you can limit it to just a speaker. So we've created more ways to allow you to better uh, connect and interact with the uh, with the folks that you're working with at that moment. Post meeting recap. This is another feature where after a meeting, if you have built an agenda, it will actually share the meeting agenda, the notes, the recording, the transcript, and an attendance report and any content that was shared with everybody who was attended, who was invited to the meeting. This is especially great if you have two or three meetings that are going to happen at the same time and you can only attend one of them. There's another one that maybe is not as important. I love the fact that I get a post meeting recap and I can take a look at it and go, ah, there's the recording and I can go into the recording, type in my name or the project I'm working on and see if I get mentioned or I come up. I can see the action items, the to-dos, everything. 
This is something that we'll be rolling out to everybody um, a little bit later on this year, but we're using currently inside of Microsoft. And I cannot tell you how much of a game changer this is when I have multiple meetings at the same time and cannot pick between them. This allows me to really get caught up or being on vacation as I was last week to get caught up on the meetings I missed very quickly and to understand what was assigned to me. We've also added more scale and support for our town halls, webinars, broadcast, and live events. We now support up to 10,000 attendees in events, uh, up to 200,000 in our live events. We Our registration pages are live, so if you're doing a webinar or you're doing a live event, you, uh, sorry, a webinar or a live event, you can do a registration automatic, automated email page that has attendee management. We can better control who can speak and who can be seen. And you'll now get post event reporting that will tell you who came in, how long were they there for, how long did they stay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, questions that they answered post event. So you can really understand what worked and what did not during the event. As we rethink the role of space, there's a lot of different things that we're doing there. Again, as we continue to look at hybrid meetings and people not necessarily being somewhere in person. For example, we've created a new feature called Front Row. Um, Front Row basically is uh, some new meeting room tools that have been designed for everybody, especially for those not in the room. This includes things like being able to see each person when somebody raises their hand, getting a circle above their hand, knowing exactly who is talking and giving more of a face to face with the remote participants, um, adding the whiteboard elements so we can see more of what's happening and more of the sort of elements that make it a more even experience for folks that are both inside and outside the room at the same time so we can really see how that might be and that of course scales to smaller meeting rooms as well as larger ones as we take a look at that we also announced mesh for microsoft teams and this is our um 2d and 3d meeting experience that's going to enable people to um connect via avatars in immersed spaces and you may be saying well I, you know I, I don't really see myself using this or how is this going to get used i think a great example of this is um during the show with polaris they talked about how they do an annual event for all their employees which in the past has been nothing more than just sort of watching a recording of a keynote they did a uh, they used sharepoint spaces and actually created a virtual event virtual booth so people could go see all of the products they were working on engage with the engineering teams, no need for 3D glasses or goggles or anything, go up, see what they were working on, chat with them and have that one-to-one -one water cooler type experience, which they were missing. And Mesh for Teams can bring this next generation of 2D and 3D to these types of meetings, especially as we see more and more large events being canceled or turned virtual because of COVID and uh, Omicron and the rest. This becomes a really great way to to look to have a experience that's a little more personal. It also creates a great footing for those who have special needs where everybody is seen the same way. And regardless of, uh, you know, if you are in a wheelchair or if you are handicapped or handicapped capable, everybody sits at the same level and that creates a really great experience and allows for people to connect on a whole new level. Continuing forward, uh, we have a wide variety of new devices that we announced um, at Ignite and uh, follow up since then. So I encourage you to take a look at our devices page. There's also some trade in programs if you have older Teams Rooms devices, where we'll actually give you money for those and help you to upgrade to newer devices. Hot desking is something that is brand new. This allows you leveraging a Teams device to be able to sit down at a desk anywhere, log in and use a uh, Outlook or a Teams device and be able to access all your meetings, your calendar, your email, everything on a device, which when you're done at the end of the day, you sign out and that device is ready for someone else to log in. This is great for information workers, folks along that line, but the hot desking experience in Teams is now live and you can leverage that today. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Microsoft Viva just because there's a ton of sessions on it, but what's really important to understand is we have connections, insight, learning, and topics. And basically what we've done is how do we give you the right information at the right time? With Viva Connections, who haven't you talked to in a while? Who else is working on similar projects? If you're about to launch a project, who else may be working on something similar? Insights, how many hours did you spend this week working after hours? And your boss, not knowing you personally, but everybody in their group, if he sent or she sent out an email on Friday 
At five, how many people spent time over the weekend working on it? How is your work-life balance? Are you able to have time during your week to get caught up on things? Are you doing email during meetings? Viva Learning, presenting you with learning portals and the learning you need around features that maybe you're not leveraging. Viva Topics and now Ally, which helps you to do things like to create company and or goals um, that you're working on or towards for projects and to be able to update that and be able to see how that works within. And that's part of a new acquisition that we did. Finally, in security, we take a zero trust architecture stance. Can anybody tell me what zero trust architecture means? Yeah, with that, you can type it in or you can raise your hand, but what does zero trust mean? Because that's how we work, whether you're in the office, at home, or connecting via new device, we look at it that way. Well, zero trust architecture means trust no one, not even your employees. Trust no one. Assume everybody is going to do you harm. And as you set up security, set it up that way and then scale back rather than going in the other direction. Currently at Microsoft, we get over 4 trillion daily security signals. These are all pow AI powered detections and automatic actions, which can include something that says, hey, Steve just logged in from uh, Redmond. And then 20 minutes later, he logged in from Beijing. That's not right. So I'm going to lock his account and I'm going to force him to reset his password via MFA. It also allows you as a human being to go in and to click on a virus, click on an issue and to learn more about it and what settings you may need to do within your admin settings to um, not have that stay or become an issue. We have over 8,500 security experts here at Microsoft. We block 9 billion endpoint threats, 31 billion identity threats, et cetera. And we are investing another $20 billion into our security infrastructure over the next five years. So with team security, we released a lot of features over the past year. So let me start with what is now generally available. That is multi-geo for teams, the retention for teams, private channels, uh, the ability to apply label retention based on sensitivity. So any conversations that say this project or confer, you know, or that basically say this is confidential, et cetera, are automatically labeled and that limits how that can be shared and who that can be shared with auto labeling inside of SharePoint and OneDrive, uh, auto labeling for continuous evaluation in SharePoint and OneDrive, graph export API for Teams messages, our uh, Microsoft 365 app compliance program. Currently in public preview is our policy scope that dynamically targets retention for specific teams, preserving the version of a file shared in a Teams message, Data governance for Teams SharePoint and OneDrive, preserving the version of a file shared in a Teams message and end-to-end -end encryption options for Teams one-to-one -one calls. And available by the end of 2021, information barrier enhancements like modes and insight cards, channel site management for SharePoint Admin Center, customer key will be supported in GCC, GCC High and DoD Cloud, and some new compliance and government capabilities for Teams. Seamless collaboration across organizations. This is Teams Connect. So what we see here inside of Teams Connect is we can see something like a supply chain alert that will happen. Uh, we can automatically add that person externally into that group and be able to uh, allow them to be a part of it without having to add them as a full customer or give them a full license. And then finally, Cloud PC with Windows 365. If this is something that folks have questions on or want to talk about, I'm happy to do it. We're really only talking about the admin and provisioning here. But if you're looking for the ultimate sandbox for your end users, this is probably one of the best ways to do it because with Cloud PC for Windows 365, you're basically through a browser giving someone a full Windows 10 or Windows 11 machine with all of their apps and allowing them to work on it. Is this like Azure Virtual Desktop? It is, although Azure Vir Virtual Desktop has a lot of overhead and things that you need to manage and set up. If you're a smaller business, you can provision a cloud PC with about three clicks and you're um, not having to pay for the Azure time. You basically pay a monthly subscription fee, but you can set that up and this is great, whether they're using a Mac, a PC, Linux box, um, I do it on my iPad. I have Windows 11 running on my iPad and all my documents and everything is there. So the Windows 365 is a great way to be able to do that through the cloud PC instance. 
These are definitely once in a generation challenges, but through those challenges are absolutely created opportunities. So I will um, put this up. I'll also make this deck available for those who want to be able to see, including all of these um, links to various content. But I'm going to stop here and I'm going to answer questions. So I'm presenting. Great. Main room, and I'm going to open it up for any questions that you have. Uh, and you are welcome to um, take yourself off mute and ask if we can do that, or you can just type them into chat. But what are your questions? What's working well in Teams? What isn't working well? Do you have a question on a certain feature, functionality, something you're not seeing, something you've been playing with that is working really well? What questions can I answer? for you. All right, I see a few up here, so I'm going to jump up to those. Hang on. Let's see, with Azure conditional access, if setting limits the guests to the web app only, does that prevent them from working on files in the team? No, it does not. Uh, with Azure Conditional Access, um, it does not prevent them from working on files in the team. You would actually have to turn that off and make them all view only. Um, but with Azure AD and Teams Connect, if you wanted to do that, you could do that with just the push of a button. So that is considerably easier to do. And if you need me to demo that, I am happy to do that. Other questions? Let's see, just thought of a question. Can you block premium actions for a user in Power Automate the way you can block premium connections from the Power Apps Admin Center? I don't know. I'm going to have to check on that, Gary. So I will have to see what the answer to that is. So I'll get an answer on it by the time we have our AMA later on today. Other questions? A lot of people in the session. I know you guys have got questions. I booked a time specifically for this. Anything you heard about at Ignite that you haven't seen yet? Anything you want to know about? Something you'd like me to demo or show off? I would be happy to do. I guess we don't have any questions. All right, I would, uh, Anya, what are the next steps then for folks that are in the session? And we may be ending a little early. I expect I usually get like a ton of questions and I was expecting them, so that's fine. You're on mute. Hey, Stephen, you got a question in the chat. How to it. obtain top level executive support in terms of strategically adopting Microsoft platform? That is a great question, Andy. Um, I recommend kind of three things and hang on. Let me I actually have some slides that may help here. So give me a moment. Let me bring this up. Find it here in a minute. But basically, um, there are really three or four things. Number one, um, can I demo Teams Connect? I can't demo Teams Connect, unfortunately, uh, because I don't have it set up right now in my demo tenant. We're using it live, but I can walk you through how that will work in just a moment. So let me answer Andy's question, and then David, I'll come back to yours. Um, so you really need to understand where the pain points are for your workers. What do I mean by that? Um, you need to be go into or do a survey with each of your teams and say, what is the hardest thing for you to do each day? What are the things that are taking up the most time? Maybe it's approvals. Maybe it's having to go back after a call. Maybe it's gearing up new employees on a project, whatever that is. You then need to go to your leaders and say, hi, we're going to be rolling out teams. These are the top issues, productivity level that we're hearing from our people and teams is going to solve this. And I would like to do a demo that shows each of these 10 issues and how we'll solve it. And they're going to go, that's awesome. What do we need to do? We need to get you to use Teams. You need to reduce, you need to only send out emails that deal with everybody in the whole company uh, or that are maybe a one to one. But anything that is around a project, you need to have that conversation inside the team. You need to turn on your camera during meetings. And if you do it, 
everyone else will do it. When people say, oh, where's that document? It's in the team for that project. Every project should have its own team and everybody should be a member of that. And that's where the documents and conversations need to happen. By showing the value that the company can gain from using this, not as a chat and um, meeting app, but as a collaboration app, and kind of walking through that and then showing the, be the before and after data can be absolutely huge. You're also going to want to look at having changed champions. That's one person from each of your different uh, groups within your company that has been trained on teams, that understands how it's going to work. So that way, when somebody in the HR group says, well, that doesn't work for me, I don't want to use it. But one of the people in you know that change champion for HR says, yes, it will. And let me show you how we can now do this and do this better and smarter. So there's a lot of different levels. It's having awareness campaigns, setting up things at lunch where you're giving up swag, uh, creating training portals, which you can do for three, free through sh our SharePoint templates and drop in training videos. But once people start to realize and see the things that were blockers and allowing them to do their job well or do it successfully and how much easier it is in teams or that whole, what does it take if you started a new job here at the company to get up to speed on a project? Being able to say, look, inside this team, here's every meeting, every chat, every conversation, every document. In about an hour or two, you can read through this and be ready to participate rather than going through this long thing, 50 emails, a share drive, and everything else. It's going to be different for every company, but those are some of the key aspects for being able to do that. Um, as for demoing Teams Connect, I do have one thing that I can share, so give me a moment and I can show that and then I can answer your questions from that. So give me a moment. Uh, let me go to the screen here and then pop that back and I can come and show how this. Okay, so for Teams Connect. Go. This, Oops. whoa. I want to screen, sorry. screen sharing issues here today. There we go. All right, let's take a look at um, this demo, which we'll walk through some of this and how this works. Stop sharing, having problems. There we go. Okay. Got one more time. Share. Desktop, the fact that Teams Connect is not working right now is kind of making things a little bit difficult for me. I screen. Actually, I'm just going to play it here. So what we see here in this video, for example, we can see that a supply chain insight got posted. So we go ahead and we click on that and we can see that there is a, this is a share channel that the channel is shared with members in other orgs. We can go in here and we can go to manage channel and we can see who is currently a member and what organizations they are with. We can add another person. This can be an external person that we are now sharing that channel with, and we can choose the ch uh, either the channel owners, the channel members, and the team. And we have now added that external member to this chat, to basically the, all the chats going on within this team. So we can tell this external person, because we have Azure AD set up, that, hey, you're now a member of this team, Anything that happens within this channel, you are now a member of, you're going to be able to work on things with those folks, but not be able to see anything beyond that channel or anything that was not shared within that channel. So what you can do is, like I said, invite those external partners that include maybe a whole team or an individual. You can now share those files securely. You can also add Azure information protection to this. But like I said, you will have to have Azure AAD set up to turn that on and then um, once you have that you can go ahead and turn on the if you have a tenant in first release you can then turn on the teams connect public preview and you can start to play with that today uh, in doing that so you will want to figure out though what are the requirements for someone to be added to a team who can do it but that's probably your best way david does that answer your 
question, at least as best as I can do it now. And I can also point you to a bunch of content online on Teams Connect that will also dig in a little bit more into the admin side of it. So Teams Connect, hang on. And I will drop in a link, give me a moment. Here is where you can sign up for the public preview. If you have a tenant in first release, so that's where you can go do that. And here is our technical documentation for um, turning on um, Teams Connect and being able to manage that with Azure AD. So I'll drop that in as well. Awesome. Any other questions? If not, we'll give everybody a little bit of time back. And I'll be in the AMA a little bit later on today. Awesome. All right. Well, have a great day. I'll see you in the AMA a little bit later on today. Enjoy your lunchtime chats and thanks for joining. And as always, my name is Stephen Rose. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter if you have additional questions and check out our show, uh, aka.ms inside micro slash inside Microsoft MS Teams and check out our show and see what all of our customers have to say. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, David. Thank you thanks, so much, David. Stephen. You have a great day as well. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was great. Thank you. Thank you.